Good morning. Scripture reading today is Psalm 1 from the NIV translation. First, let us pray. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, prepare our hearts and minds to hear and accept your word for us today. Silence in us any voices but your own so we may hear your word and live it out in our daily lives through the Christ Lord. Amen. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the path of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of our Lord. Good morning, everyone. Uh, My name's Ed. I get to be the family minister here at our church, and I'm grateful to have the chance to wrap up our summer series. It's been wonderful to dwell in these psalms and to invite their core message to be on repeat in our hearts and in our minds. The ultimate playlist. What a great thing to have going on, hopefully, in our minds and hearts as we continue to learn and grow as disciples. Now, when it comes to our scripture readings on Sundays... The preachers here at Village Church get to choose the translation we want to preach from. It's kind of nice. And that becomes the version that gets read to the congregation. Now, since almost none of us understand Hebrew or Greek, maybe some of you do, uh, we all need an English translation, typically, of the biblical text in order to study it together, right? As for this morning, the translation I chose was not the NRSV, as you heard, Uh, which that's the Blue Bible. If you're ever in the pews and you see the Blue Bibles, that's an NRSV translation. That's what we normally preach from. Um, But about a month ago, I chose to go with the NIV translation, which is what you just heard Kyle read for us. Thanks again, Kyle. I chose the NIV because at first glance, I preferred the way it translated the first word of this psalm. Now, did you catch it? Did you remember what the first word of today's reading was? Anybody? Who can, if you know it, it was blessed, or as sometimes church people call it, blessed. Uh, it's the same thing, no matter how you say it, blessed, blessed. The NIV translators went with the word blessed. So maybe you're wondering, if the NRSV version doesn't say blessed, what does it say? It says happy. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, but ultimately their delight is in the law of the Lord. Happy? It just felt like a downgrade to me a little bit. I mean, blessed seems like a better choice, right? Okay, so uh, maybe you're wondering, Ed, what is your problem with happy? So here's my problem with happy. I want to confess to you, I know that this is my baggage and that your miles may vary, but for me, the word happy makes me think of things like the happy meal, okay? Or these little guys, um, these minions. Now here's the reason. Um, It's not because minions make me happy. In fact, quite the opposite is true. Uh, They do not bring me joy. Um, It is because of the song that was on the Despicable Me 2 soundtrack that played nonstop for all of 2014 and like then uh, beyond. Do you remember the name of that song that you could not escape? The name of the song was called? Happy, of course. Now, think about on repeat. Like, anyway, it was on repeat for sure. The next one was one of my anthems, this next image, uh, sung by none other, none other than Ren and Stempy. Uh, who knows the uh, classic tune? Because if you were an early 90s kid, Saturday morning cartoons, there was one song we all knew. And, we, and right now you hate that I brought it up because it is just an earworm and you're just going to hopefully forget about this. But the song was called Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy. 
It is creepy and weird, and I thought I'd never have the chance to show a Ren and Stimpy image at church, and now I had the chance, so uh, check that off my bucket list. Now, then there's Put on a Happy Face from Bye Bye Birdie. And then there's the song Don't Worry, Be Happy, as if people uh, can choose or simply will themselves to just be happy in moments when they're feeling discouraged or sad. Like the next time you see someone changing a flat tire on the side of the road, in the rain, on the interstate, probably don't roll down your window and yell, hey, don't worry, be happy. Um, so happy from Psalm 1 just didn't seem sufficient to me. But here, here's the good news, right? After studying the passage for the last few weeks, I think God has helped me to more fully embrace happy here, especially in the context of this psalm. And please, I really don't want anyone to leave here today thinking, man, Ed really hates happiness. Like, that's not what's happening. The, the truth is, we all, we all want to experience heartfelt happiness and delight. I think we all want that. And if you want to be happy, and I believe that you do, and I believe God wants you to feel that way as well, I think Psalm 1 points us in the right direction. And that direction is the real focus of this sermon, and it goes way beyond seeking happiness. In a way, it has to. It must. Here's what I mean. Author and pastor Tim Keller once had this to say about happiness and the Christian life. He said, happiness can never be found directly. It is always and only a byproduct of seeking something else more than happiness. It's always and only a byproduct of seeking something else that is more than happiness. Luckily, the Bible doesn't hide what that something else is. We read about it in Psalm 1 and nearly everywhere else in the Bible if you're looking close enough. In fact, at the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, Jesus says, blessed are those, or as some translations say, happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Then again in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, in the same sermon, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And the, all these things he's referring to are the things we typically look to make us happy and secure. And at the end of Psalm 1, King David wrote, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Did you pick up what it is? The something else we are to seek that is more than happiness is righteousness. It's righteousness. Now, for a Christian, righteousness is about being right in the eyes of God, being in right standing with God. It's about living a life that is pleasing to God based on God's standards and values, which are taught in the Bible and exemplified by Jesus as our example. Anything that is not pleasing to God is the way of the wicked. Jesus teaches us that human life has always been a never-ending series of choices between these two ways. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, there are two houses. We sang about it in that last song, Firm Foundation. There are two houses, one built on sand, one built on rock. Where the building your house on the rock means living out Jesus' teachings, righteousness. He says, build your house on the rock and it will stand, but the house built on sand will fall with a great crash. In that same chapter, Jesus says, there are two gates, one that is narrow and one that is wide. We also sang about that earlier today. Enter through the narrow gate, he says. It'll be hard, but it leads to life. As for the wide gate, it's easy, but it leads to destruction. The narrow gate is the way of righteousness, and the wide gate is the way of the wicked. Again, in Psalm 1, King David shares that the way of the wicked are like chaff that gets blown around by the wind. It's just kind of temporal here and gone. Um, it is not secure. The wind just blows it away like chaff. 
while the righteous are like a tree planted by streams of water. Now, I'm not sure how many of you know this, but my family and I used to live in Northern California for a while, for about four years. I served as a pastor, uh, one of the pastors at a church out there, and during a sermon series where we focused on the Psalms, our church invited my friend Regina and other artists. There's a dancer, there's a painter, uh, there's a musician, and we kind of got some artists together to try to represent some of the Psalms through arts. And Regina was commissioned to create something based on Psalm 1. And this is what she created. It started with her going for a long walk and finding this amazing spot. Uh, Here's the actual place where she found it, right? So she found this after going on a walk in Livermore, found this spot, and after taking a couple photos and starting the painting there, you know, she ended up finishing it, and again, it looks like this next image here. This is the final uh, painting she created. It was eight years ago, y'all, and I remembered this uh, two weeks ago, and I'm like, wait, Psalm 1, Regina's put her painting. Like, it just came right back to my mind. Because this image, to me, is so striking and, and invites us to really consider what David's trying to help us understand here. It started, for, again, going for a walk, and this is how it turned out. When you look at this scene and when you see this tree rooted right next to the stream like this, I hope it helps you to grasp what King David was trying to convey about what the life of the way of the righteous is like. What it takes to be rooted in God's righteousness is found in verse 2. Happy are those who delight, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. So, first, let's talk about delight. It's a great word. Um, I love that we get to talk about delighting in God's word and delighting in the law of God. I don't know about how you feel about laws and rules, though, but delight isn't the feeling that washes over me when I first think of laws and rules. However, The law of the Lord is not simply referring to all of God's rules and do's and don'ts of the Christian faith. Delighting in the law of the Lord is all about finding happiness and satisfaction in God's teachings and commandments, fueled by a deep, heartfelt appreciation for God's guidance and wisdom. Because that's a gift. It's not a given. The law of the Lord refers to the entire body of God's instructions and revelations to us. Now, we may not not think about this a lot, but God didn't need to send us his word or reveal his will to us through prophets and biblical authors, but God did. And without God's word, we'd we'd be lost. God's word leads us to understand how how God made us and how he designed for us to live. Through his word, God went to great lengths to help us understand who we are, what wisdom is, how much we're loved by God, how valuable we are to God. It contains the gospel, the best news on earth, and the only eternal hope any of us have. If you've never delighted in the law of the Lord and experienced firsthand how precious and beautiful that it is, if no one's ever helped reveal it to you and show you uh, how wonderful it is to open it up and meet God in those pages, I would encourage you to talk with me or somebody else here from the church about getting into some kind of Bible study group. Now, maybe you can't commit to a weekly thing. I don't know what you can do, but I hope you'd pray about how you can make that happen. However it works for your schedule, commit to reading the Bible together with some other people. Maybe it's just your family. Maybe God gave you the ultimate small group and it's called the people you live with. You know, just start somewhere. Read the Bible with other people and trust in God's Holy Spirit to bring the pages to life. The way of the righteous is very connected to knowing and understanding the Bible. It has to be. Otherwise, how could we ever meditate on it? You can't meditate on something you don't know. So let's talk about that. This word, meditate, can be a tricky one to grasp uh, in 2024. I'm not sure what comes to mind for you, But when I think of the word meditate or meditation, uh, for many people, it usually involves someone sitting with their legs crossed and some frilly pillows and incense burning on a little coffee table and maybe a little Zen garden with a rake on it. I don't know what comes to mind for you when you hear meditation, but that's what typically comes to my mind. But this is not, and that might be a very meaningful experience, 
that idea of kind of like finding stillness, quieting your mind, emptying your mind for some peace. Awesome. That may be good, uh, a great practice. I'm sure it can be healthy and meaningful. But this is not what David's talking about. Christian meditation, when you hear about meditating on the word, it doesn't have to do with emptying your mind. It has to do with what someone chooses to fill their mind with. And in this case, our aim is to fill our minds with the law of the Lord. So how can we do this? Well, first of all, we do it imperfectly. I don't know about you, but I have other things in my mind sometimes. I invite things that aren't uh, of God into uh, my regular thought pattern. I'm not 120-7 always thinking about God only all the time. I confess to you that. I, I, I'm not that person. Um, I want to more and more fill my mind with the things of God and the law of the Lord. But I do it imperfectly, and my guess is that some of you probably do it imperfectly as well. So here's what I think. I think it's a little different for everyone, but the Bible, if we're gonna meditate on God's word and the law of the Lord, the Bible is a necessary part of the process. (laughs) It has to be included. Here are some ideas for you to maybe find a way to weave that into how you live. You can add some Christian music to your daily routine with lyrics that are rooted in scripture. Songs that aim your mind and your heart at God through praise. You can use the same approach with books. There are lots of great Christian authors and great Christian devotionals. Um, Spend some time with other Christians. Come to Sunday dinner. Let's eat together and let's like celebrate who God is, right? Anybody uh, want a really good meal and hang out with fun people? Come on uh, a week. Yes, a week from tonight. Good, I saw your hands. Now you're coming. Good. Um, A week from tonight. Listen to some Christian podcasts uh, where they discuss the Bible. You know, again, find me after service if you'd like some good suggestions for a a good Christian podcast. Uh, I will give you one right now. It's called The Holy Post. It's fantastic. Uh, Listen to that. When you read the Bible, consider going uh, slow and praying as you go or journaling your prayers. I think journaling when you read is really helpful to meditate on God's word. Try engaging in maybe a creative process of some kind, like my friend uh, Regina, uh, the, the way that she painted that picture. And she talked to me, we talked this week, it was great. We hadn't talked for like seven years. And she was sharing about how she still uh, is brought back to that moment every time she sees that painting in her house. And um, however you can use the creative gifts God gave you, you were made in God's image. And part of God's character, part of what God is like is God is creative. And so, if you're made in God's image, there's a part of you that when you create, when you make something, that taps into something special. And if you can involve that creativity and how you dwell on and how you think about the word and how you apply it and how you share about it, do it. I lost my place. However you can be about joining in God's mission, Simply aim to fill your mind and heart with the things that reflect God's heart as a disciple. One of the things you can do is come to our adult classes. We have them every Sunday. Um, Bill Pickett teaches an amazing class, and there's an 11 a.m. class usually during the regular year uh, in Fireside. Come to one of those. Learn with other Christians that way. Or if you want to grow in your faith by serving with kids and youth, I could help you out with that. I know somebody who can help you with that. Um, But let how you think as you dwell on and as you meditate on God's word, be the foundation for all your other thoughts. It's not about denying that you have other thoughts. It means that those first thoughts, those foundational thoughts, let them be fueled by God. Now, back to the tree for a moment. David said, the way of the righteous are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither, and all they do, they prosper. How is this possible? Because I know it isn't for me. This isn't exactly how it goes for me. I can tell you my leaves wither. (laughs) I do not prosper in all I do. I fall way short of the example David shares about uh, when it comes to the ones who follow the way of the righteous. There's some good news here. Luckily, in John chapter 15, verse 4, Jesus tells his disciples this. He says, Abide in me as I abide in you. 
Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. As Christians, we must recognize our need for Jesus because without God's help, we have no hope of truly living in the way of the righteous. If you are rooted right there, sustained next to this flowing river of God's wisdom and love and generosity and grace, if that's where you've planted your life, then you got some hope to experience that way. But you gotta go to Jesus. You gotta ask him. No matter what season you're facing, you are going to get the whole life nourishment you'll need to get you through it if you learn to abide and remain in that spot, in Christ, as Christ is in you. Our leaves may wither, but his never do. Didn't mean to rhyme there. That was an accident. There are people, though, and things that are trying to move you off of your spot. Like maybe you've been in a season where you've really wanted to be close to God, close to his life-giving source and power and wisdom. Like you've wanted to be right there, but there are people and things that are trying to yank you off the shore, trying to unroot you and replant you somewhere else. Have you ever experienced that? Ever felt the tug? We live in a world that wants to move us off of that spot. I'm sure you've felt that before. But if you stay rooted in God's righteousness and you can get some help by being a part of a church like this, that's part of why we come here, y'all, so we can learn to do this together. If you can stay rooted in God's righteousness, if you choose to abide in Christ, God will keep you standing. Jesus says, abide in me as I abide in you. And just like a healthy, like rooted tree can withstand storms. Like we were outside at the 830 and luckily I had like a huge tree, like literally right behind me next to a creek. Like it was a perfect example, right? But just like a huge tree can withstand storms and strong winds and snow and heat and like a bazillion cicadas, Psalm 1 wants you to know you will not be standing alone because God's righteousness will sustain you. It's God's righteousness, not our own, that will do it. This is what David meant when he wrote, blessed are those or happy are those who delight in the law of the Lord. Jesus followed the law of the Lord. Jesus followed the law of the Lord to a T. And thank goodness that we are in Christ. But here's the thing, unless we're humble enough to recognize our need for the law of the Lord in our lives, we'll never really care about it. And maybe we shouldn't be too surprised whenever we ask ourselves in seasons, you know, where we're drifting, like, man, why am I not more happy? What's wrong? Why are things not the way I had prayed and hoped for them to be? How far off of that shore have you allowed your mind to drift? The reality is that's where you always are. You're always safe and secure because you're in Christ. But when we stop dwelling on and stop meditating on the law of the Lord, stuff gets confused real quick. Now, please understand, my takeaway for the sermon is not simply read your Bible more and work harder. No, that is not what I'm saying. Our right standing with God is not based on our obedience or our righteousness. It is based on Jesus's. Second Corinthians 5.21 says this, for our sake, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are so in Christ that we are called the righteousness of God when we're in him and trusting in him, when that is where we plant ourselves. You are in Christ if you've trusted in him. The good news is you'll find in Jesus the happiness you've always looked for. In him, you'll find that happiness. But you need to go to him for it. Given the choice now between these two ways, taking the way of the wicked or the way of the righteous, which way do you want to take? It's a real question, y'all. You got to say it now. Come on. Yeah, I know. It's an easy one, the righteous. Nobody chose the wicked one, right? Okay, good. I'm just going to assume that's what everybody said. But now, here's where the real question becomes. How do you want to walk that path? 
because there are two ways to attempt walking the way of righteousness. There's a religious way and there's a Christian way. What I mean by that is, some of us think the way we stay righteous is by how well we're doing. How good have I been to my Bible study? How much have I prayed? How good am I at performing the tasks of the faith? Now, are those bad things? No. But are they what make us right with God? No. It is Jesus and only Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and rose again to life three days later. What he accomplished is our entry. It's what he did. And as we learn to trust in what he did, we can learn from him to be like he is. That's the life of a disciple. That's what it's all about. Learning to live the way of the righteous is the way Jesus modeled living. That's what it means to be a disciple. And it's like only if maybe, I don't have enough time. We need like a whole series to follow this sermon about discipleship. I mean, that would be really convenient, you know? Maybe we should do that. Yeah, right? Huh. You should think about that. Um, Jesus lived a perfect life without fail. He is the perfect image of the tree David describes in Psalm 1. So when you dwell on and when you on repeat think about being rooted in God's righteousness, know that it is not your own efforts you're rooted in. You're rooted in and secure in and safe in Christ. That's good news. And as you learn to dwell on him and to reflect him and to live and trust in him more and more, I do believe that is how you find not a perfect life, uh, not a worry-free life, uh, but a darn fulfilling and happy one. Will you please pray with me? Lord, thank you that you want for us to have wisdom and to have strength and to have an understanding of your forgiveness. But Lord, thank you also that you want us to be happy. You want us to have joy. You want us to find it ultimately in you, the only trustworthy place to go for it. And God, as we live this life and we constantly see uh, in hundreds of ways each day the decision to either lean in to the wicked path or to the righteous path, my prayer for us is you'd remember who Jesus is and that we are in Christ and that Christ can be our model in all things as we attempt to live this way you've built for us to live as your disciples more and more each day. Remind us, play on repeat in our minds and hearts that we are safe and secure and rooted right there next to the stream that is your love and your grace and your power and your wisdom. That's where we are, that is who we are. Keep that on repeat in our minds and hearts, God. We love you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.